Hello and welcome again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now the latest chapter, this growing in popularity saltwater podcast series. And in this series, what we do is we reach out to the captains, guides, and fishing enthusiasts from up and down the North Carolina coast that we have relationships with and ask them to share their insights on how to catch more fish more often along the NC coast. But truth be told, I don't know if the goal is just more fish. I think our approach here is getting you to spend more time more often on the water with more friends and family catching more fish more often. I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host, my co-producer, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. How you doing, Billy? What's up, Gary, man? I'm doing good. Good to see you. You're looking good. I got my ears lowered since the last time we met. I did notice. <laughs> I did notice that you're tight. Yeah, my wife was tired of looking at my shaggy head. She said, go get a cut. So you got a cut and for her got- birthday. Yep, exactly. Want to look good for her. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get into this, Gary. I want to just remind people how to watch and how to listen. Um, here is our uh, little list of places you can find us. So we're on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcast, and also available on YouTube. And be sure when you uh, go watch our YouTube channel that you submit and subscribe. That way you get all notifications. Hit the little bell there so you get a notification when we launch something new. And you can watch our video. If not, you can listen on one of those podcast platforms. Um, so, yeah, Gary, really excited to um, see that YouTube channel growing, man. It's doing good. So. Yeah, man. I, I, you know, I like looking at numbers. I realize I like looking at numbers. I look looking. I like looking at comments too. Yeah. Like to see what people are saying, but <laughs> yeah. I like I like to I like to see the numbers go up. It seems like it's popular. It yeah, seems man. like our vision is working. Absolutely, and it's all made possible by Marine Warehouse Center. This episode is, and we really appreciate those guys. And so here's a quick word from them. Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have it. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Once again, another awesome video from those guys. Man, they're great guys. Makes it, makes it easy. Just they're great guys. And, go. and you know, that brings to mind. <laughs> uh, here we go. If you remember the last podcast, I asked if there was an Emmett, North Carolina. Okay. I think you said, I think you said yes, but you were wrong. There is no Emmett, North Carolina, at least that we could find, or okay. at least that I could find. So in that spirit, true false. All right. Here Billy we go. Thorpe. There is a Stovall, that's Emmett's last name. There is a Stovall, North Carolina. Uh, I'm going to say you're trying to trick me. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. That's a pretty good odds. Final answer. Yes. Last names. Yeah, absolutely. 100% yes. And you'd be correct. Granville County. What do I win, Gary? What do I win? A trip to Stovall, North Carolina. Just throw Emmett's name around, and it's like a key to the city. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, that's it's all a key I got to the city. do. Hey, Emmett told me to come by here and get some donuts. Emmett Stovall, that is. E- Emmett Stovall told me. Yeah. All right. That's what I'm going to do. How far is that from here? Do you know? No, I do. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to Google that right after, right after the shoot we're, when we're done. Show me a fish photo. Here we go with our fish photo of the week. Oh, here we go. Ed, I'm going to mess this guy's last name up. I don't even know. Ed, Cloninger. Cloninger, yeah. Ed from Germany uh, with a 16 and a half inch trout cut off of Sea View uh, Pier using shrimp, man. Good looking fish. Good looking shirt. Good it, looking shirt. You know, that I can't say that isn't part of the reason why I picked that photo. <laughs> like, I like the shirt. But as it would work out, we are talking pier fishing today. We are talking pier fishing today, and we actually have someone from Seaview Pier, or at least who frequents Seaview Pier All right. often. And so what we're going to talk about today, I, I meant to do this before I switched over to Billy. We're going to do the top species for summer pier fishing. Top species for summer pier fishing. And my guest for this podcast, our guest for this podcast, is Tim Chavez. Tim Chavez of Seaview Pier in Topsail. 
And he's also has his own YouTube channel, the Tim F. Chavez YouTube channel, Tim F. Chavez YouTube channel, where, you know, he's out on the pier, he's doing reports, and I don't think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that knows more about sea view pier fishing or perhaps even topsail pier fishing. Um, check out that YouTube channel. And we have him here today. Um, let's bring him in, Billy. Bring on Tim for me, please. All right. How's it going? Good to see you, Tim. Good to have you here. Thank you for doing this podcast. You know, uh, what I've been saying is, you know, we have a special place in our heart for pier fishermen. I don't know if they always get the coverage they should get. Maybe even in my own newspaper, they don't get the coverage that they should sometimes get. So I love having you here talking pier fishing. And the standard question before we pull you into the main, the main topic is, Tim Chavez, why should people stay tuned? Why should people listen to what you have to say about pier fishing? Okay, I'm a lifelong fisherman. When I moved to North Carolina in 2009, I decided to get as close as possible to fishing. So I ended up moving right into the Sea View Pier. So I put a lot of, it was just like me and a little kid again. Every new fish that was getting caught, never seen before. So it was always, how big is that? How big did they get? How often did they get caught? And what do you catch them on? So I got to learn it all. And, and so it was fun. Well, right on, man. So we're going to talk about, and again, I haven't done a great job of setting this episode up. I usually cover this material in the intro. But I put to Tim, I was like, man, I want to do summer pier fishing. I want you to give me the top three species. And you kind of gave me three. You kind of gave me more. But I, I like your approach. We're, we're considering blues and Spanish as a category. We got speckled trout as a category. And then we got black drum slash sheep's head as a category. So those will be the three categories. I hope we get through them all. I hope we have time to get through all three. We're going to go through them in that order. But okay. it is a podcast tradition to have two non-fishing questions prior to the material. Two non-fishing questions. However, I have, I have fishing questions. Sure. So here we go. Our conversation yesterday, you seemed like something of a Sea View Pier historian. I don't know you that well, so I'm going out on a limb here. I thought about calling Paul Park and asking him for an embarrassing question to ask you, but I went more conservative. I want to see if my instincts are correct. You are, in fact, a Sea View Pier historian. Which topsail pier caught the most kings in 2019? Uh, uh, well, Sea View really didn't have its end built. Uh, Surf City got theirs built out first early in the spring, so a, a Surf City caught the most. And I think Jolly Roger might have got this third, but I know Seaview ended up with 15 kings, and we only fished for the month of November. Yeah, you had to. You know what? I should have put Dude. factor that in. Yeah, man. He. Yeah. Get harder questions, Gary. All Come right. on. <laughs> All right. Here we go then. Seaview Pier. Let's go 2016. <laughs> what was the heaviest king caught from the pier in 2016? Oh, we normally have a big fish pot. You know, where, you know, the guys at the end, you know, you put in like $10 each and yeah. we catches the biggest king, you know, we get it all. And typically, you know, and the largest king is always around 36 to 40 pounds. But I think that year we might have ended up with a big fish pot of 50.1 pounds. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 50. We wouldn't know. I mean, he can pretty much say anything right now. Uh, yeah. And we'd be like, all right, we're not going to call him a liar. <laughs> 50.1 it is. 50.1. Yeah. George was the one who caught it. And George's last name? Oh, it's a German name, so I might, you know, okay. not pronounce it correct. Well, Billy's not going to pronounce the German I, last name. Nope, not we at all. established that in the photo um, promo. Hey, Tim, let's get back to business. All right, so that concept that we talked about, the concept that we sort of fleshed out, was top species to target from the pier during the summertime. You know, so we're not talking about the king mackerel. You know, you explained to me that topsail, that's more of a fall action, big red drum, more of a fall action. So blues and Spanish, I think, is our kickoff. So give me the give me the primer on. I want to go to the pier this summer. I want to have the best chance of success at catching some blues and some Spanish. Where do you start? Oh, uh, the mornings and the evenings are the best times uh, around top of the tides, you know, or with cleaner water. Sometimes when the tide falls out, we get clean water. Um, you know, when the tide comes in, sometimes it, it you know, dirties up the water because the loose sand on the beach, you know, makes it kind of cloudy. But, uh, you know, uh, for blues and Spanish, that's more kind of a more action pack because you're uh, either jigging or you're throwing gotcha plugs. Uh, the 
the best type of jig to use is uh, like a diamond jig, which is normally some kind of a one ounce weighted uh, a lure on the bottom. And then you got some uh, gold hooks that are on drop hook rigs. So you normally put like three or four of them. You know, so these are what we call the gold hook rig. Let's see if you can see a little better over here. This is, and that's what you do is just have uh, some gold hooks. You drop it down, let it hit the, you cast it out, let it hit the bottom. You reel it the slack, you pop the rod up, let it fall back to the bottom, reel it the slack, pop the rod up. And that works like the bottom to the middle, middle of the water, water column. Another thing that you, people use or they catch bluefish and smash on are like gotcha plugs. You know, uh, uh, some of the better colors are, uh, you know, white in cartreuse, white body, redhead, white body, whitehead. Uh, when the days get a little dingy, you know, you go to a little a brighter, you know, color, maybe like cartreuse with a redhead. Or during the sunny days, what seems to work really well are like a chrome. You know, a chrome with a little green head or chrome with a silver head or chrome with a redhead. Those work good on the sunny days. Cast it out. Kind of have your rod pointing down at the water, reel the slack, give it a pop. It's kind of like a pop, real action, pop and real action, pop and real action. So the lure kind of does a little, you know, does a little walk the dog as it's coming through the water. And, you know, that's working more of the top and the middle, middle water column and that entices the fish to bite. All right, man, you've given me so much to play off of here. I love how we're all, I love the start we're off to. All right. So for one thing that I was sort of struck by is that you're saying that the Low tide is actually cleaner water when you're fishing from the pier because the incoming water stirs up the sand. That's correct. Right on. You, you, you wouldn't think that, but that's just how it is. As the tide falls all the way out, since the sand doesn't really get uh, moved around much, it's more of a harder packed sand, the water kind of clears up more. And then is, it, is the water quality, water clarity more important, or is it more early morning you know, late in the day, which, which would be the well, single biggest factor? Uh, since they're sight feeders, they need to be able to see the lure. So, you know, if the winds were blowing, if the wind's blowing above 15 knots, it tends to stir up the bottom, the water gets sandy. And of course it's a little harder to catch the fish. The days where it's like 10, 15 knots or lower, you got cleaner water. So you got a better chance of catching them. So cleaner water is the key, even more than targeting the morning or the late afternoon hours. I really yes. want to try to plan around the cleanest water, and that's based on tide and wind, as you just told me. That's correct. That's correct. mostly mostly wind. You know, like I said, the winds at 15 knots or above, the water you know tends to get dirty. You know, if you get the days where you know the winds you know stand below 10 knots, five to 10 knots, or five to 15 knots, those are good ranges. You know, especially if the wind's blowing from the beach onto the shore, like the southeast or the southwest or south winds, those tend to bring in the cleaner water. To keep the sand and the mud up on the beach on the shoreline, and you know, get, got a better chance of catching the sight feeders. Now, is that is that holding up true? What you just told me for both blues and Spanish, they're both susceptible to that cleaner water, or is it Spanish more yes. susceptible? Yes. Well, yeah. Well, they're both sight bluefish. They got a little more sense, you know. But if you because they eat baits in the dirty water, but you know, obviously Spanish are more of a clean water fish. And then where am I trying to get on the pier? Am I trying to get towards the end, near the end, halfway, work different parts of the pier? What's the best practice there? The bluefish, they tend to get caught, you know, from the surf zone all the way to the end. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, us, the guys king fishing, you know, we might not have luck towards the end catching bluefish because that's what we use for bait for a king mackerel. So we might have to go towards the front of the pier, like the middle or up in the surf zone because that's where the you know, the sea mullet and the spot and the smaller fish are, and that's what the bluefish are feeding on. You know, so you got to go where the bait is, you know, to catch those fish. And then the, Sp Span go the, ahead. Spanish, the Spanish tend to get caught more halfway to the end of the pier. You know, every now and then the guy, you know, will, will catch them up towards the surf zone. You know, if the bait is running like in the fall, you know, when you got the mullet running down the beach, the Spanish tend to get more close to the shoreline. So when I'm doing these podcasts, often, you know, often I approach it from someone who really has a lot of questions, you know, who is starting maybe even from ground zero. So, so that beginner that's saying, man, I've always wanted to get on the pier fishing. This is perfect. I'm going to use this information. Go try it out. And can that beginner, can he go out on the end of the pier or is that King Mackerel territory and you got to stay back? 
what, what is the what does the new guy need to know about peer etiquette? Uh, we, most peers, uh, the top so peers, I know Surf City and Jolly Roger. You know, if there's you know four or more people king fishing, then you know there's a, a line that you know there's no plugging or bottom fishing in the king fishing area. But if you're you know up to that line, you can. But uh, like on Sea View, most of the Spanish are actually caught on the about halfway to three quarters of the way out. You know, about the three quarter of the way out area is where you know most of the Spanish and bluefish actually get caught. Because sometimes when we're down to like two or three people king fishing, you're allowed to bottom fish and plug off the front. Some guys will come up there, throw plugs, not have much luck. They'll go back, you know, three quarters of the way of the pier, and they start catching them. You know, I guess maybe it has to do with the water depth. Because towards the end, you know, we got 20 foot of water. But when you get like, you know, three quarters of the way on the pier, it's more like, you know, 15, you know, 10, 15 foot deep. So maybe the, uh, the you know, the fish will be able to see the lure because, you know, they ain't so much water that you got to work through. And then what about which side of the pier? Does that even matter? Like, you know, I mean, I'm not even sure if it's an East Facing pier, but is it more the north side, more the south side? Does, does that vary? It's, yeah, you want to fish into the wind. Which, whichever side is coming, fish in, with the winds in your face, you feel the lure into the wind. As uh, typically, the uh, the current is moved with the wind, and the current will bring bait fish up against the pier. So the fish, you know, the, they'll they'll stack up on the wind side of the pier, and that's the side the blues and the Spanish tend to be caught on is the windy side. Okay, man, that's good. That's good to know. All right, now I want to go back to that uh, that diamond jig rig you first showed. So I want to talk about that a little bit more, and then okay. we'll go to the gotcha plugs. Um, you sure. gave a good foundation. So on that diamond jig, what did you say? It was like a one ounce? Is that what we call it? That's right. It? Yeah, one ounce. And does and the color of the diamond jig matter at all? Gold, the gold ones tend to work the best. You know, you could get silver ones. You know, they, they kind of work some. Or also sometimes I throw a, a pink, you know, a pink and cartouche one that, you know, kind of works fairly well. But day in and day out, the gold is, you know, that's the one that, that is, they key into. Also, you, on the diamond jig, you got the gold hooks. For some reason, the gold has a nice flash to it. The Spanish, it looks like glass minnows to them. And they really bite on just these gold hooks. And the diamond jigs, for, you know, for weight, so you can cast it out. But, you know, it's also a, a jig. Is that mono you're holding up, or is that fluoro? Uh, it, it's 30-pound mono. Uh, some people might use fluorocarbon, but I, I don't see the difference between fluorocarbon and mono because sometimes the water's a little murkier. You know, maybe if the water's really clear, which, you know, CV really doesn't get clean water, so uh, you can get away with mono. But mostly they see the flash of the gold hook or they see the flash of the, of the jig, and that's what they're biting on. And the length of that leader material from the diamond jig up to the loop where you would affix to your line, that's what, how far would you call that? Uh, I generally space the, uh, the two hooks, or I got three hooks, about a foot apart. Okay. So that way when uh, you throw it out there, you let it hit the bottom, and as you pop it up, you're working like three foot of water column. And then if you lift up your rod, your rod's seven foot, seven, six. So you're working from three to, to tw ten foot. Okay. So you're working a, a large spot of the water column. Some people put the the hooks a little closer, but I th tend to have more luck with the, the hooks a little further apart because you're working more of the water column. So you're figuring out whether the fish are feeding more on the bottom or if they're more mid-column you know, with the diamond jig. And you'll get blue Spanish hit on any one of those hooks, top, middle, sometimes, bottom, gold hook, or the diamond jig itself. Sometimes you get a fish on every single hook. You might get a blue fish on every hook. You might get a Spanish on every hook. Sometimes you might get a blue on a couple, a Spanish on one. You know, so it, it depends on, you know, how lucky you are, I guess. And I think, I mean, I think you said it's not important to really bomb that rig out there. So distance isn't that important when you're casting out. You just need a little bit of water to work it back to or no, go ahead and give it a, a good heave and then be able to cover more water back into the pier. If you're seeing a school of bait coming at you, you know, you want to work that the bait because that's where the fish are going to be. But typically, I'd say about 70% of the fish are caught within 20 yards of the pier. Like I said, uh, uh, when the wind blows, it's blowing the bait fish up against the pier. They're using it for cover and also shade from the sun. For some reason, you can look down there, you can see like glass minnows. 
So a lot of fish are feeding right at the edge of the pier. So as you're bringing the lure in closer and closer, you know, sometimes you can just drop it straight down, just work the jig straight up and down, you know, right, right, right underneath the pier and you catch them that way also. If I'm seeing a bait school, am I trying to put that diamond jig right through the middle of the bait school or just trying to get in the vicinity of the bait school and don't want to bomb it right through the middle? Yeah, if you put it into the bait school, you most likely end up just, you know, snagging bait fish on your hook. So the best is to work the edges of the bait school because that's where the fish, they're hitting the, you know, they're attacking it and cutting out of it, attacking into it, cutting out of it. So they're picking off the fish on the side. So you want to work, work the edges of the bait, whether it be menhaden or, or finger mullet well, or, you know, sometimes schools of a shad. Okay. So let's say someone like, I don't know, Billy Thorpe, my co-host. <laughs> finds a bluefish dumb enough to bite his rig and he has it at the pier is he just reeling it up as fast as smooth as he can and pulling it over the rails yeah you want to use like a, a size 3000 reel or larger you know, if you use a 2000 it's kind of small in case you get multiple fish on you know your diamond jig you know you might need someone to hand line it up but otherwise uh yeah they have tough mouths you know you they you just crank them in flip them over the rail Spanish, they have a little softer mouths, so you might want to play them in a little easier. Uh, and you know, if it's a larger fish and it doesn't look like it's hooked good, you probably want to get it in a net. Okay, a larger fish not hooked well, get into net, otherwise, we can reel it up. And then, that's right, what are you doing with your drag, man? Are you locking it down pretty tight because of pylons, or you want some play in it? Uh, yeah, you, you want some play in it, you know, you don't need to lock it down. And you know, if, if you were, you know, drunk. Fishing for drum by the pylons or sheep's head, that's when you want to have more drag. But uh, you, you tend to have it just tight enough to where when you're snapping it back, it's not, you know, pulling drag out, you know, when you're using the gotcha plugs. And then I think this is my last question before we go on the gotcha plugs. And then, so I catch that blue fish, I pull it over the rails. Man, maybe I don't want to take that blue fish home. The guys on the end, king mackerel fishing. Good etiquette to ask them if they want it. Yeah, it's possible. Well, there's a, a three fish limit now, so you know, um, you know, you know, you, I'm not sure if you can pass off your limit, but yeah, okay. you, you, so each person could have three blue fish that they could use throughout the day. It used to be a 15 fish limit, but this year they dropped it down to three fish limit. Okay. And, and you know, the guys on the end do have buckets, so you know, if you brought a blue down there, I'm pretty sure they'll put it in their bait bucket and use it for king mackerel. Okay, man. And also, you get some tarpon and cobia also. All right, so now let's go a little bit more on the gotcha plug. So you have different colors, and the primary variable that determines what color you like to choose depends on water quality, water clarity? Uh, it's more of uh, whether it's sunny or overcast. That's, okay. you know, that's what dictates, you know, it may be the water quality also. But uh, typically, white on white is is you know the top choice because you know it matches what they're after. They're after you know the glass minnows, which are a little minnow. They have like a little silver stripe on their side, and uh, or you know the shad, which you know are, are a little bit bigger of a fish, and you know they're pretty shiny. So you know white or chrome, those are the top two. And thirty pound leader for the gotcha plug. Yeah, well, sometimes with the gotcha plug. I might use a fluorocarbon leader just so that we can entice the Spanish because Spanish do have good eyes. Bluefish, you know, they're more like cats. You know, they'll jump on anything that moves. A Spanish might swim up to it, might see it, it doesn't look right. You might turn away. So, you know, to entice more Spanish with a gotcha plug, you, you know, it's better to use fluorocarbon. And at 30 pound because they do have sharp teeth. Um, and then how long would that leader be? Uh, I use about a three foot leader. About a three foot. So, you know, I'm using a... Uh, uh, braid and typically you throw a 14 pound braid and I tie a tie in a three foot feet of, of fluorocarbon. And then last question on that, I'm tying a loop knot to the gotcha plug because I want the most action or I can tie a knot that just sinks down tight. Uh, I just tie a sink down tight knot. Okay. I think it, it, with the loop knot, uh, it, it might get a little more action, but you know, I just cinch it down. Okay. Um, so we're out there, we cast it out far or no, again, the same rule applies. Most of the Spanish are caught within 20, what do you say? 20 yards of the pier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the gotcha plug, yeah, it's probably best, you know, to 
you could throw it out there, start working it right away, or you could throw it out there, let it sink all the way to the, to the bottom, and then start working it back in. Uh, t- typically, the fish on gotcha plugs tend to get caught a little further out than, but diamond jigs because they're working the deeper water column. Those, that's why they tend to catch the fish closer. But uh, with the gotcha plug, the fish tend to bite a little further out. I don't think. But I've... still, most of the fish are caught within 30 yards of the pier with gotcha plugs because they'll, they'll follow it in and then hit it. I don't think I've ever been patient enough to let a gotcha plug go to the. I didn't even know they went to the bottom because I've never been patient enough just to see. The, if that's what would happen, but that's what happens if I wait long enough, it goes to the bottom. That's right. And, and actually, when we get into the fall, uh, you could use these these pink gotcha plugs right here, and you slow roll them up in the serve zone, and you can catch speckled trout with them. Huh. Right on. Well, I tell you what, um, I think speckled trout was our second species, so okay. maybe that's our segue into speckled trout. But before yeah. we segue into speckled trout. You know, anything about blues and Spanish, I didn't ask that you think people in general should know anything we didn't get to cover? Uh, okay, with the, with the, to catch the larger Spanish, yeah. they definitely prefer live bait. So, you know, fishing, you know, shad off a king rig or uh, fishing a shad fly line off the side of the pier. You just, uh, just you know, small piece of wire, treble hook to its side, let it swim along the side of the pier. That's how you pick up like the four, five, six, seven pound Spanish. I think Sea View Pier probably catches the largest Spanish from the East Coast. I know uh, like two weeks ago in three days, we caught, uh, I think it was like 63 Spanish up to seven pounds. Man. Um, so you know, what's those the Those tip- are all mostly off the king rigs on live bait. And then a couple, you know, fly lined off the side. If I'm diamond jigging and gotcha plugging, what's the typical size I can expect through the summer months? And can I expect, can I expect action throughout the summer months? Uh, yes, but it's mostly, you know, concentrated in the mornings, in the evenings, typical gotcha plug size Spanish is, you know, a pound up to maybe four pounds or maybe three pounds. And every, every now and then you might get lucky and you might pick up something, you know, five or six pounds, but typically, you know, the ones, the larger size ones do hit live bait. I think it's the sea view pier record is close to 9.2 pounds for Spanish. Man. What about size of the typical bluefish through the summer months? Uh, this, uh, probably one to two, one to three pounds. Okay. Well, man, talk to me about speckled trout. I mean, people love speckled trout and I think, I think many people just don't assume that summer is a good time for speckled trout. I mean, I imagine that, that some people have that belief, but you're telling me speckled trout's a pretty good bite from the topsail piers from sea view pier throughout the summer. Oh yes. Yeah. You, uh, in the summertime, to catch trout, you have to use live bait under a, under a float rig. And, uh, and you need to fish it actually deep. Actually, i got a rig. Yeah, man, show me something. So this is a, this is a, a typical float rig. So we got, a, we got the float. Yep. Got a quarter, a quarter ounce weight. Yep. Barrel swivel. Yep. And I got about uh, two feet of fluorocarbon, 30 pound, and a treble hook. So you hook the shrimp on live with the treble hook. The, the, the bobber is on a slip slip slide. Yep. So it, it moves on the line. You want it to move. And then you use a, a uni knot. I got a uni knot. On the top, which will prevent the bobber from going past a certain area. Okay. What you do is uh, you fish it. You want to fish your bait about two to three feet off the bottom. Uh, there's a couple bobbers that people get. There's like this one, which is a weighted bobber. This is what you do not want to use because you're going to throw your line out there. It's always going to sit, sit up right. You're not sure how far you are on the bottom or if you are on the bottom. When you have a non-floated, non-weighted float – so you go out there, you move the uh, the stop, moves up and down the line. You can move it up. So you know you want to maybe move it up, maybe to ten foot, so the so the bobber could be able to slide up ten feet or so. Throw it out there, and you see the bobber go. If the bobber goes and it goes lands sideways, it means your your weight is on the bottom. So you want to make it shorter. Okay. You want to move it down like two feet. You want to you want to make sure that you're fishing two to three feet off the bottom. If you start picking up pin fish, you're fishing too deep slide the slide down or if you go further out on the pier 
you might need to slide the slide up more so that way you fish deeper but you want to fish about three feet off the bottom about three feet off the bottom and then that's right so tell me about the pier man am i in the surf zone am i out or do you just move around to try to find fish it can happen anywhere uh most of the trout are caught the first quarter you know you're definitely not in the surf you're more uh, starting about where it's you know about seven seven eight foot deep and maybe about to three quarters of the way you know you're definitely not off the end most most of the trout are caught about two fists to three fists down the pier you know so so you want to if you've never been to an area before like i said you want to put this uh, slide about 10 12 feet deep throw it out there see if the bobber see if the weights hit the bottom slide it down a little bit throw it out there see if the weights hit the bottom slide it down till you know where you know the bobber floats upright once you got the bobber floating upright then it's time to put on a live shrimp on the hook and you know toss it out there generally you want to stay away from the pier because if you just drop it close to the pier you're going to end up feeding pinfish catching pinfish so just kind of you don't need a far cast just lob it out there you know 15 20 yards you want to fish on the windy side so you want the wind in your face also okay throw it out there and the bobber kind of drifts towards you if it starts getting close to the pier, you have no luck, reel it in, flip it out a little further. You know, some days you might need to put it out there quite a bit, but most of the fish are caught, you know, within, I'd say, 20 to 40, 20, 10 to 20 yards, I would say. 10 to 20 yards from the pier. And then too more, close more to like the pier, 15, equal, 15, 15 to 25. And too close to the pier can often equal pinfish. That's right. You end up with a lot of pinfish. And, you know, if you're out catching shrimp or buying shrimp, you don't want to you know pinfish also the reason why you're using 30 pound fluorocarbon is because you will catch a lot of bluefish bluefish will bite your hook off okay um what size treble hook you got on the bottom of that rig this is a size four size four treble hook and also when you're uh when you hook up the shrimp when you got the shrimp in your hand you'll see it has a little horn on the top of its head underneath the horn there's gonna be a little triangle and in that triangle you're gonna see a clear spot that's where you're gonna want to poke one of the barbs of the treble hook through the clear spot of it. Mm -hmm. So that way he's hanging off it and he's kicking and he's moving around. That's also why you have a, about two feet of fluorocarbon. So that way the, the trout could swim around, he could move, he could dodge the fish. That kind of makes him get a little angry and the trout will eat it up. If the, if the shrimp is dead, for some reason the trout won't touch it. But if the trout sees it kicking and moving, I think it's when, when the trout kick and he closes up, and he kicks and he closes up. When he closes up, I think that's when the trout go and eat it. Huh. Um, yeah. Where, so at Seaview Pier, am I buying live shrimp or what's up? I mean, I'm intrigued and I'm sure many people are. How do I get my hands well, on some live shrimp in the summer? Yeah, Seaview uh, did have a, a, a live well, but they don't have their uh, bait pump set up because it was on the end of the pier and they just recently you know, got it done. So they haven't had that set up. But uh, uh, the local area to buy it in uh, Topsail area is One Stop Shop in Surf City. It's where the old swing bridge used to be. They they normally keep a good supply of live shrimp. And then what's my best? What's the best technique for keeping that live shrimp alive while I'm fishing on the pier? Uh, like a, fi a five gallon bucket aerated. Five gallon you know, bucket aerated. Bubble, yeah, or in, in you know any kind of a bucket you know a bed. Five gallon bucket works good. Get a, a, a bubbler, you know, it runs on D batteries. Let it go, and that, that should keep them alive. Okay, man. You know, it, it it might keep them alive for up to two days, and after that, you might need to freshen up the water. As long as you got it aerated, they should stay alive. So all yeah, day long without changing water, though. I don't have to worry about changing water over the course of one day of fishing. Um, you probably could fish that day. And it should be good. Okay. But if it's out in the sun, yeah. by the end of the day, you know, you might need to just change it because the water temperature is building. Because as it's blowing the warm air into it, because the air outside is kind of warm, yeah. the water tends to uh, raise in temperature. And then on the trout, um, what's the size, the typical summer size of speckled trout for the pier anglers? We catch trout off the pier up to four pounds. Three. Every now and then you might get like a five or six pounder, but you know, the average size is 18 to 23 inches. All summer long? Yes. Right on. Um, 
I think that brings us to the end of the speckled trout. I'm going to give you the same question I did with the blues and Spanish just to wrap up. You know, have I have I not set you up? Is there anything else? Any final thoughts for the person who now thinks, man, I want to go catch some speckled trout off the pier this summer? One thing about trout is you want to fish with a light drag, and uh, the way they'll bite is just it, you see the bobber there, it'll slowly go down, and you just let it go down about a foot, a foot and a half, and then then once you see the bobber about a foot and a foot, a foot and a half down into the water, you just ease up on the rod some. And you, you feel the rod come tight, you feel it start bucking its head some, and it's real into it. They got soft mouths, so you don't want to horse them in. Just kind of play them in easy and slide them into the net and get them on the pier. So it's not going to be a quick bite. It's not going to be all of a sudden that bobber just goes, bloom. It's going to be more right. of a if slow the bobber action. takes off quick, it's typically a bluefish or it might be a Spanish picking up. And they'll just, the bobber, boom, go down real quick. Also, sometimes you might pick up a lazy ladyfish or a lizard fish. But the trout bite will definitely be it'll, – it'll slowly go down. And I see him swimming up, grabbing it, and he's going back to where he is. Because like I said, you're fishing two, three, four feet off the bottom. They might be like a foot on the bottom looking up. They'll see it, kick it around. They'll go up, grab it, and they'll swim back to where they were. And I don't have to worry about a quick hook set. I want that bobber to slowly go down. What you say, about a foot and That's a half? right. If, if you set the hook too quick – you might just pull it out of their mouth because maybe they didn't get the shrimp all the way down or something. But the best is just wait till you see that bobber, you know, slowly go down. It's about a foot, a foot and a half down, and then just lift up the rod. You're not doing a bass, you know, hook set or perking, jerking. <laughs> you just lift it and come tight, and you got it. And then am I stand a reasonable chance of reeling that fish up to the rails, or am I now more in pier net territory? Yeah, you're more in the pier net territory with, with the trout, especially, you know, if it's a little smaller one, you know, 14, 15, 16 inches, you might get lucky to be able to flip them up. But, you know, as you get up 18, 20 inch trout, yeah, you probably want to get a net. And is net share something that's pretty common on the pier? Because everyone's cost conscious. And if someone wants to try out pier fishing, that's a tough expense is to come out of pocket for a pier net if you just want to try it out, see if it works for you. How, yeah, Jeff, how friendly Jeff, is the crowd? Yeah, uh, they, they're pretty good. You know, most people on the pier, they see a fish getting caught. They want to help someone get it on the, on the pier. You know, no one, I haven't seen where someone says, can I, you know, use that net? And they're like, oh, you know, get your own. It's just like, they see, oh, you got a nice fish. They want to get it up on the deck for you. And so are most people with a net, are they like, sure, you can use my net? Or is it more like, here, let me use my net for you? What, what, how does that usually go? Uh typically they will, you know, net your fish for them, okay. for you. Even better. I mean, yeah. even better. Man, we're killing it. We're, this is great information. All right, last species or last grouping was black drum sheep's head. And I think you like to target sheep's head more. Um, and I was saying, hey, man, we just had a sheep's head podcast. So I, I was probably thinking of pushing more to black drum. But, you know, this is great information. I just want to know what you have to say. And it seemed like sheep's head – with a black drum bycatch chance. So if, if yeah. that's your best game, then then tell me about that game. Okay. Uh, well, mostly, you know, I, I think it's more the other way. So I, I like to catch, I like drum fishing. Okay. So, you know, black drum is, is good, you know, but the same baits catch sheep's head. Typically, uh, uh, you know, I, I use, uh, uh, here's one of my rigs I use, the uh, uh, weighted bottom with circle hooks. The uh, bottom hook is, is set up to where, you know, it's it's on the bottom. So even when the weight is is resting down, you know, the the bottom hook is on the ground. Okay. You use sand fleas, fiddler crabs, or this rig is set up for big pieces of shrimp. Normally, people get to the pier, you know, you might go to the bait bait store and they have the big, the bigger uh, uh, shrimps. And uh, the people that are uh, spot fishing or mullet fishing, they're normally using smaller baits. They get the head, they pop them off, they throw them in the water, and that's what the black drum typically eat. So what you want to do is maybe get one of the fish heads or shrimp heads, put it on one of these bigger hooks. This is like a two-aught circle hook. Fish underneath the pier, and the black drum are down there typically getting fed by other fishermen because they're popping the heads off, throwing them over. And uh, they'll readily eat the uh, shrimp heads, and you pick up some nice black drum. Also, a, another place we could target the black drum is uh, in the surf zone. 
You definitely want to fish where the white water is. So, so on the days where there's a little more windy, you might see white water on the beach, you know, where it's breaking and uh, stirring up the sand fleas and the crabs and, and crustaceans. That's where they're feeding. Or you might see the outer bar where the water's breaking on that white water. You want to fish in the white water. That's where you target the black drum. If I'm fishing underneath the pier, am I still in that white zone or am I? Am I... No, because the, the, the pier is structures. So you're fishing by the pylons when you're fishing under the pier. And the black drum could get caught from the serve zone all the way out, about three quarters out to the end of the pier. Sometimes uh, uh, I haven't seen anyone catch. Well, yes, I have uh, seen people catch them you know, out on the king area. But typically about three quarters of the way down. That seems to be a, a, a good depth. They seem to hang out. Maybe it's the shade of the pier, but toss it under the pier next to the pylons, and that's how you catch the black drum. And every now and then you might pick up a sheep's head because they eat the same the same baits, and you know, which are sand fleas, fiddler crabs, and urchins. And you're saying fish under the pier, so you're not saying just drop it straight down, but actually give it a little bit of swing to go under the pier. Oh, uh, uh, you Yeah. Put it kind of like a little under the pier, you know, by the pylon. Okay. Sometimes you can put it, you know, as long as, long as you're close to the structure, that's good. And your sea view, sea view has like three pylons. You, you, there's a out, two outer ones and an inner one. The front of the pier only has two pylons. So as you get towards, you know, the middle of the pier to work the inner pylons, you know, you got to toss it a little in. And, and when you're fishing by the pylons, you definitely want to have your drag up a little tighter so that way they don't wrap you on the pylons and then i'm sorry if i miss this man when you're finished when you're fishing the white water though i'm not limited to just by the pier i can cast out and cover some more water away from the pier if i'm in the white stuff that's correct you could bomb it a country mile if, if that's what you want to do or or fish it you know anywhere as long as you're in where the white water is stirring up the bottom that's where they're going to be feeding that's the feeding zone because they'll swim up and down the beach, you know, looking for spots where there's sand fleas or, you know, little uh, clams. And that's what they're feeding on. So you want to put your bait right in the zone where they're feeding or where the, you know, the white water is because that's where they're going to be feeding. All right. So when you were talking to me about blues and Spanish, you said, don't get it too close. You're going to, or maybe it was the trout. I'm sorry, the trout. Don't get it too close because of the pinfish. So that's are correct. pinfish going to be a problem with my black drum fishing? Uh, no, because uh, the uh, the harder baits like the, you know the uh, fiddler crabs, the pinfish really don't mess because you know they got shell to protect themselves. Uh, the urchins, same thing. The pinfish really can't get to them because you need something with you know hard teeth to break through them. The sand fleas, the pinfish might kind of peck at them a little bit, but it, they're not, it's not too bad. If and you fish at night, you know if fishing at night tends to uh, the pinfish for some reason don't feed as much at night. So you have more chance of your bait being down there. Especially if you want to use big pieces of shrimp, you use them during the daytime. The pinfish have a field day on them. They eat them up. You'd be changing their baits a lot. If you save the bigger piece of shrimp for at night, fish those underneath the pier or in the whitewater area, you have a lot better luck with, with the softer baits. Okay, so... Talk to me more about, I guess, black drum time. I mean, this is all great information. So black drum is a 24-hour potential bite. I'm not worried so much about tide. I'm not worried about morning or evening um, other than nighttime to protect my shrimp bait, if that's the bait of choice. Yeah. Uh, I tend to have more luck with the black drum, or I've you know, seen uh, more black drum get caught on the falling tide for some reason. When the tide's rising up, you know, you may catch a few but they seem to tend to bite more when the tide's falling out, you know, whether it's day or night. When the tide's moving out, that's when they seem to get caught. Red drum tend to get more caught when the tide's moving in, you know, in the surf zone area. And then what's that black drum bite going to feel like? The, they just grab it and go. You know, that's why when you got circle hooks, they'll bite it, they'll turn, they'll swim away, and, you know, they'll put the hook right in the corner of the mouth. You know, some people use J hooks, you know, you got to watch your pole a little more, you know, you see the bite, they might just pull the pole down, you know, kind of hard, and then you set the hook into them. And then the typical size of the black drum you're seeing through the summer months? Uh, the, you know, 
I guess they have to be, uh, I think, uh, 14 inches to keep. You know, you might get some that are undersized. You might catch them up to about uh, three and a half pounds or so. And every now and then you might get a little larger one, you know, up to five pounds or, or and then possibly larger because they do, you know, get up to 80 pounds. Um, and then I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a creature of repetition at this point. Any final thoughts on black drum, you know, to wrap up that species? Uh, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, I guess what you could do uh, or so what, you know, kind of helps some is, uh, is if you're using a softer bait, like a, a shrimp, you could get like, uh, uh, the fish bites, you know, in clam flavor, or I guess they have sand flea flavor. You put a piece of fish bite on there, you know, just, just enough to fill up just the gap of the hook. You know, you don't want to put a big old monster piece just in the gap of the hook. And then you can put your shrimp on it. So in this case, you know, the pinfish eat off the soft bait. At least you still got another uh, bait. And and also, they tend to uh, get caught more on the orange color. But I think it might, you know, uh, it might uh, look like a sand flea. So they, they spot the orange, you know, because they got the green, I think uh, some natural color and uh, blood warm color. But the orange tends to work good for the black drum orange fish bites um sand fleas and fillers for sale at seaview pier that's right okay they got all that oh, no 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 they don't have that you yeah. have you know you've got to go to the beach okay and dig up your own sand okay. fleas and the fiddler crabs you gotta you know go to the marshes to capture those all right man uh tim i think i mean i think that brings us to the conclusion of our three top three summer targets when fishing from a pier in the summertime man i think that was fantastic i think that was very easy to follow i think many people now will have more confidence going forward man i appreciate your time that's good maybe i'll meet them on the pier and i can because uh you know i put a lot of time on the pier I put so much time that uh, the owner he actually asked me to uh, update their uh, uh, fishing page and fishing report so when you see uh, a fishing report with a lot of words the tide you know the water clarity water temperature you know how the bite was going typically that's me and then there's a couple other guys that do it if it's just like you know a couple words and a picture that's typically them but if you see something with a lot of information those are normally my fishing uh, posts well man tell tell our viewers a little bit more about your youtube page again it's tim f chavez youtube channel what's that all about oh well uh, i'm uh, mostly it started out just uh with just the large catches you know every now and then we'd get a king mackerel on i'd do a video of you know, it's catching one or Spanish or red drum or tarpon, you know, every now and then, you know, you might do a shark. And then, uh, you know, I started uh, updating the uh, fishing reports for the page and then it, it turned into a video fishing report. So, you know, I tell what's been catching, what been biting during the day, you know, if it's been fast or slow, uh, what is biting on. We talk about uh, the water clarity, you know, because that, that matters for the sight feeders, uh, the wave heights. And, uh, and yeah, and, you know, and, you know, other information is sometimes I, you know, I give, uh, tips on the wind, which is the best wind to fish for different species. And also I try to give a, a, a little forecast of how the next upcoming days are. So that way those who, you know, live, at, you know, a couple hours inland, they, they can anticipate what it's going to be like and plan their trips. Right on Tim. Thank you so much. Look forward to bringing you back. Maybe we'll talk kings from the pier maybe we'll talk big red drum from the pier i know we got a lot more potential targets potential topics but man we yeah. love that you spent some time with us today definitely yeah catching the big reds in the fall that's that's what i like to do <laughs> nighttime fishing catching big reds that's that's, that's cool it is cool i agree yeah. i need to get on that campaign billy yeah Billy, what is up, man? I did not do what again. Episode? I did not do a good job of setting this up. I did not remind you, Billy, that at the end of the podcast, we're going to say, Billy, what's the best Billy's best takeaway? So I hope you're programmed at this point, even though I didn't remind you at the beginning. I'm a pretty sharp guy, Gary. You are a pretty I sharp got guy. It. Well, and with someone like Tim, man, gosh, how could you not learn something? Right. That's so much good. I'm like never even thought about pier fishing, really, besides like, oh, you want to go pier fish for a couple hours? Yeah, whatever. I don't know. But dude, I'm going. I'm like. For a guy like me with no boat, <coughs> anybody out there who wants to donate one, <coughs> I'm just going to keep putting that out there until Santa yeah, comes. I think you're going to Sea View Pier. I think you're going to watch <laughs> Tim's YouTube channel. Then you're yeah. going to go to Sea View Pier. You're going to make sure he's there. And you're going to say, Tim, 
I listen to every word, but just tell me where to cast and what to cast. Yeah, and, and luckily for me, I got Tim's number, so I just text him, make sure it's predictable. But what's your best <laughs> takeaway from the podcast? Uh, man, I was pretty impressed with the diamond jig with like the uh, gold and then the gold hooks, like the bare gold hooks. I was pretty, I, I, you know, I'm like never thought about throwing a hook in the water without something on it. So I was pretty shocked by that. And then how to work it. Cause I'm, dude, I'm, I'm like, Oh, this is heavy. It must mean I zing it to the moon. And no, not really just drop it at your feet and, and work the whole water column was pretty impressive. Yeah, man. I think I'm definitely trying that one right on for sure. So it was good, man. What an episode. I'm glad I get to watch it before everybody else hang out there and crush the people. I mean, yeah. people got me put on demos tomorrow. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, look at this. I'm just catching them. No big deal. Tim's my mentor. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Uh, anyway, I'm going to stop being a nerd. <laughs> What's up? What, what do we got going on, Gary? Wrap, wrap us up. Here we go. How to watch, how to listen. If you've enjoyed this podcast as much as I have, uh, one, be sure to go check out Tim's YouTube channel. I'll plug his again, man. Just, uh, I watched it earlier, so really great information. Uh, but while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Listen to us on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And it's very important that you like and share those ep- those podcasts and those episodes. And once again, just a great big old shout out to Marine Warehouse for uh, helping us out here and, and being a big supporter and sponsor of the show so yeah and be sure to submit your pictures yeah man send us some pictures send us a video video one minute or less we'd love to get that as well um and uh yeah man thanks for another week absolutely we'll see you guys next time thanks are you still